Welcome to the 131st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Joe Lansdale. His new novel, The Thicket, is out and in bookstores today. Also, Joe has the unique distinction of being the first author that I've interviewed twice on the podcast. I mentioned it in the interview with him, but I thought I would mention it up here at the beginning. Uh, And finally, just a note, if you do enjoy the podcast, if you find value in it, if you could just take a minute or two and leave a review for the podcast on iTunes, it helps other people find the podcast. Again, stay tuned for the interview with Joe Lansdale, author of the brand new novel, The Thicket. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Joe Lansdale, the prolific and award-winning writer of numerous short stories and novels, many of them set in Lansdale's native East Texas. Lansdale's latest novel, The Thicket, has just been published by Mulholland Books. In an early review of The Thicket, Book List had this to say, The Bard of East Texas is back. He has been writing brilliantly about East Texas for three decades, but never has the region appeared stranger or more violent than it does here. Memorable characters, a vivid sense of place, and an impressive body count make the thicket another Lansdale treasure. Joe Lansdale, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Sure. And I should add, you you have the honor of being the first writer that I've interviewed twice for the Reading and Writing Podcast. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I interviewed you for the eighth episode of the podcast, and now 120, 120 interviews or so later, I'm glad to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> what book were we, were, were we promoting then or talking about? Do you remember? Uh, which book? Um, I honestly oh, can't, was it a book? I, I honestly can't remember which book it was specifically, but we had a good conversation. Not me either. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, can I have you read the first couple of pages from your new novel, yep. The Thicket? I didn't suspect the day grandfather came out and got me and my sister Lula and hauled us off toward the ferry that I'd soon end up with worse things happening than had already come upon us, or that I'd take up with a gun-shooting dwarf, the son of a slave, and a big angry hog, let alone find true love and kill someone. That's exactly how it was. It was the pox got it all started. It had run through the country like a runaway mule and been especially unkind to the close-by town of Hingegate. It showed up there as a bumpy, oozing death and killed so many of us caught an epidemic. Two of the ones that died were our Ma and Pa, and neither of them had ever been a sick a day in their lives. I, on the other hand, was sickly all my early life up until the time I got my health, and Lula had been kind of scrawny her whole time, but neither of us took it. I was by this time a healthy 16-year-old, and she was 14 and right on the verge of her bloom. The old pox passed us by as if it was blind in one eye. It crept up on Ma and Pa, fevered them up, covered them in blisters, and made it so when they tried to breathe, it sounded like a busted squeeze box. The worst thing we had to sit and watch them die, and there wasn't a damn thing we could do about it. We couldn't even touch them for fear of coming down with it. Pox ran all through the town like it was looking for money. Dead people were piled up outside houses, loaded in wagons, buried quickly. In some cases, they were burned when nobody knew who they were, as there were folks that traveled through town and got it and died without leaving information on their names or where they were going. Sheriff Gaston finally had to put signs out on the roads coming in that said nobody could leave and spread it, and nobody could come in for fear of getting it. That's, that's great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about The Thicket yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, I think... You know, like a lot of people say, my books are kind of hard to describe, and they're they're even harder for me to describe because I don't think about <laughs> definitions when I write them. You know, uh, I would say that it's, that, that if you like um, historicals, you like adventure, you like a little bit of a literary taste, and I, you know, I don't mean that in any kind of uppity way. If you like something that has unique characters, uh, then you have like something that's at the turn of the century and dealing with how people arrive at accepting change. Uh, and uh, there's some, you know, some blood and some thunder. Uh, then this might be the book for you. That sounds great. Well, well you just mentioned that it's set at um, early at, at the turn of the century. Um, did were were there any stories or, or research that you did of of um, preparing to write this, or or was it just? Um... Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I grew up uh, with like like I've said before to other in other interviews and stuff, probably to ad nauseum. But but my 
my father and mother were older when I was born, and my father was in, born in 1909, my mother in, I think, 1914. Uh, and uh, so... They went through the Great Depression and all that stuff, but they had grown up with stories from their people who, of course, were in an earlier time. And my grandmother, who died at about 100, had seen Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and all the, uh, and had been in the Oklahoma land rush and all that stuff. And she used to tell me about that when I was a child. And uh, she was born in the 1880, I think 1880, something like that. You know, she just... You know, I think her parents did the land rush. She was just about that time. And then when she was a little older, she saw the dregs of the end of the Wild West show. And she had experienced uh, coming to Texas in a covered wagon. So I, I really kind of had a lot of background there. Plus, I had grown up, uh, you know, reading about the, the history of the Old West and, and Texas and, and different things like that. And, you know, I had a lot of relatives who, you know, had had relatives who had fought in the Civil War. And so, uh, like I say, that was one of the, the benefits of having older parents is that they had older stories, and they had many of those stories from people older than them. Sure, sure. Well, as I mentioned earlier, many of your novels and short stories, like The Thicket, are set in East Texas, and you're yeah. obviously writing out of your own love and knowledge for the region of America where you yeah. live. I I'm curious, was, was there a process in your own early writing career that – that led you to, to writing about this region? Yeah. As a matter of fact, when I started out, I wasn't writing about East Texas. I was, and I was writing terrible stories anyway. It wouldn't have mattered where they took place. They were just awful. <laughs> I was trying to learn how to write. But what happened was is that um, I was reading a lot of crime and mystery stories. You know, I was trying to sell to the mystery magazines and the science fiction magazines and things like that. And then I came across a book that my mother had in her collection that was Alfred Hitchcock's uh, stories that that he supposedly collected, actually, you know, some ghost editor collected for him. But amongst them was a story by Artis Mayhar called Crawfish, and it took place in East Texas, and it had an East Texas voice. And I just freaked when I read it. I said, you know, this is my home. I recognize this. And it gave me permission. It probably took me a little more time to come to that realization totally, but it gave me permission to write about my people and stuff I knew. And it was it was then that I gradually began to have this transition, which it took me several years. But what's funny is that we were living in a in farming in a little place called Smallville, doing truck cropping, as we used to call it, which means it's the very small crops that you carried to market by truck, pickup truck. And uh, we moved to Nacogdoches, and the first person I met here was Arthur Mayhar, and she was the writer, and she was became one of my closest friends. She died just last year. But Artis and I became just really close friends. She was older than I was, and uh, she was more like an aunt than she was just a friend. And it, and I always told her, I said, you know, had I not read that story, my career may not have happened, or it might have been totally different, and in my mind, blander and less interesting. That, that, that's interesting. So so I, I wanted to uh, talk about your writing process. I, I follow you on mm -hmm. Facebook, and you share a lot of writing tips and advice. Yep. Um, at, at this point, when you sit down to write a short story or novel, what what do you have in mind? Have you thought about the plot, or do you sometimes literally start with an image or even a sentence and see where it's it takes It's more of an imagery for me and more of a sentence. I'm more of a, it, I, I start more with an emotion. I know that's kind of a strange thing to say. I just have a feeling... And that feeling will cause me to sit down, and it usually results in a in words that result in a, a, a tone and character. And once I find the character's voice, if it's first person, or I find the story's voice, because see, I believe the story itself should be a character, not just the characters in it. I think sometimes you can even do uh, sort of characters if the story is a character. I did a book called Zeppelin's West and one called Flaming London that I felt didn't really wasn't supposed to contain characters so much as it was supposed to have characters, and the form of the book was the character, because I felt like I was doing a parody, pastiche, and a loving nostalgia, juvenile feel to these things I grew up with. So sometimes the story is, is, is the character, and even when it, you have strong characters and strong um, atmosphere and all that in the story and, and style, it's, the style helps it become a character, whatever kind of story you're writing. So for me... It kind of builds itself as I go, and I write in the mornings, and I'm sure I'm plotting in my subconscious, you know, because every time when I get up the next morning, it's rare that it isn't lying there and wait for me and ready to go. When I, when I was in, we spent 
six weeks in, in uh, Italy, a lot of it in Rome, and every morning before we would go out and do whatever it is we wanted to do, I would get up before um, my wife got up and our, our daughter was staying with us too, and I would write, and I wrote two-thirds of a novel while I was in Italy doing, you know, I guess some some tourist stuff and visiting with friends that we have there, doing some things related to my books. And so to me, that story just felt like it was given to me. And But I'm sure it's my subconscious. And, and a lot of times I may have been working on these stories for years in the back of my head. But that said, I never sat down and consciously plot or make a chart. I might have a note beside my machine where I say, don't forget, this guy has blue eyes, uh, his, his hat is gone, that kind of stuff. You know, he lost his hat. But as far as like plotting it out, laying it all out, that, if I did that, I wouldn't have any interest in writing it. That, that's interesting. So so when you when you are working, um, do you have a specific goal for your writing day or number of pages or words? Yeah, I, I try to do three to five pages a day. That doesn't mean I limit myself to it if I'm on a roll, but I try to revise as I go. And then when I get finished, of course, you know, I do one more revision. So I, I do what I call a draft and a polish. But that doesn't mean if I think something's wrong that I wouldn't go in and, you know, do a, a tremendous redraft or revision. Uh, but most of the time, I get it pretty close to what I want as I go. It's probably 90% there. And then when I do the polish, I pick up the next 10%. And, of course, you know, sometimes there's editorial suggestions or proofreader suggestions, and those two, you know, are, are added in at a later date. But for me, three to five pages a day is my goal. And if I get three, I'm happy. If I get five, I'm real happy. And if I get over that, I'm ecstatic. That's great. Well, well, I know that that you and mentioned that's five to seven days a week, by the way. <laughs> okay, and and I know that you that you mentioned um, uh, earlier that that when you first started out, that you know, in your words, you were writing kind of awful stories, and, and oh yeah, what, what what kind of kept you going? I mean, was there was there was there something in your mind that you knew that you had to kind of go through that process of writing? bad stuff to, to get to? I think so. I, I think that's what a lot of writers these days don't know, and people ask me questions that they could easily find out for themselves or that they're not. And, you know, when they do that, I know that they're not really serious because we didn't have the Internet. And I went out and researched this stuff. I'd never met another writer until I met Artis Mayhar, and I had already been writing for you know since I was nine years old. I had no idea what editors did or who they were. or wh- I knew they were in New York, and that's about all I knew. And I didn't know how to submit a manuscript. I didn't know if you wrote it in longhand. I didn't know you had to type it. Fortunately, I could type, and I, and I learned to do that. But I started buying Writer's Digest and The Writer, which were two magazines that were popular then. I think Writer Digest is still around. But I would buy those and uh, read all of the articles. And after a while, the articles were repetitions. And when I got to that point, I realized, well, okay, I probably gleaned all I can get out of this. But I read autobiographies by writers. I read biographies by writers. I learned more from that than I did anything else about how to be a writer. And it taught me that, you know, it isn't always easy. And, uh, you know, it isn't always a, uh, a given that you're going to do it. But I had a strong work ethic. I had a martial arts attitude. Uh, and I went at it like that. And my wife, <clears throat> when we were farming, she had a job. She got a job working at a place that packed lunch meat in freezer cars, and I was working in the rose field, and we had a terrible winter with horrible rain, and it looked like it was just going to be awful. So my wife said, look, I've got a job. Why don't you take about three months off? Because I'd already been selling articles, so, I mean, you know, I'd been doing it. And she said, why don't you always want to write fiction? Why don't you write fiction while in these next three months? And so I just sat down every day, and I didn't know any better, so I wrote a story a day. I thought that's what I was supposed to do because I'd read about all these pulp writers doing that. And so I wrote a story a day for 90 days, roughly, and I got about a 1,000 rejections on those 90 stories because there were so many magazines back then. You could send them out. You could send one story to 10, 15, 20 markets. So all of those 90 stories were constantly recycled. Plus, I also sent it to markets that didn't buy those kind of things, but I didn't know. I did everything by, you know, a learning process by – you know, hammer and tong. I just go at it and see what happened. But there was, I there was never a time when I didn't think I would make it. There was a time when I thought I I might just be a uh, you know a hack because I didn't know I had any real talent, but I knew I had the damnedest desire of anybody alive. And then as I wrote, 
I begin to realize that, you know, I, I, I think I have a knack for this. I think, think this is it. And because I never studied in school, I didn't have a college education. I, I had a couple of years of college. Um, I was self-taught. My father couldn't read or write. I didn't come from a highly educated background, except my mother, who was self-educated and very smart and very, um, you know, much a part of why I was so interested in this kind of thing. But, you know, I just had to figure that out. And nobody I knew was a writer or knew a writer. Uh, you know, they might write letters, and that was the closest thing to it. So to me, it was a constant development, a molding through, you know, fire, so to speak. And uh, that was it. I mean, I don't know how else to tell you other than to say that I just learned it by doing. Sure. And failing and failing. You know? <laughs> and you, you mentioned earlier when in, in that in that explanation, you mentioned that you you took kind of a martial arts approach. And I know yeah. that. Uh, I know that you have long been um, uh, involved in martial arts. And, and, well, and what, what, what years next year, next month, or month after next? I'm a little uncertain, uncertain if it's September, or October, but 51 years is small. Wow. And 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 what do you what do you mean when when you say that in terms of approach? Well, I mean, it's a no quit attitude for one thing, and it's it's focus without being aware of focus, which is why I don't plot. That's being aware of focus. If someone throws a punch and you're concentrating, oh, they're going to throw a punch, you'll get hit every time. But if you just react to the, you just respond to what happens, that's a martial arts approach combined with that no quit attitude. It's sort of like having focus and energy without consciousness. It, it's, it's, I mean, at its peak. And so to me, that's, that's, I went at riding like that. Plus, I grew up with a real work ethic. I mean, I, I worked in aluminum chair factories, I, I worked in farm fields. So it never occurred to me that you weren't supposed to work to get it done. And what happened was I soon developed the ability to do it more comfortably, more naturally, and especially after I discovered my own writing style, which is what martial arts about is about, is self-discovery. And that was part of it. And when I developed that, I realized, damn, this is fun. I look forward to this. I know there are writers that you know, crucify themselves every day and talk about how miserable they are and they like having written, and that's fine. That's their approach. But that's not it for me. I mean, I, I figured if I was going to do that, I might as well get a job that was, uh, you know, in a factory or a foundry. At least I was certain of retirement, you know. Well, back then you were. Now you're not. Uh, so so the thing, and, and that's what people say. They say, how do you do this? And, you know, you have to be it's not, uh, not certain. And I always say, you know, nothing is certain. You know, it's no certainty that you're going to retire when you are or that you're going to get Social Security or that you're even going to live till tomorrow. So all of that that kind of martial arts attitude of energy that, you know, don't worry about death because you're already dead is when you get into the moment. Uh, is all of that tied together for me because I really, really believe that stuff. And uh, it's not a religion, it's a philosophy. And uh, that's how I go at it because I'm not religious at all. Right, right. So, so going back to kind of the writing process, do you ever sit down in the morning and when you're in the middle of a novel, as you talked about earlier, does it, does it ever, do you ever encounter where it's just not flowing that day? And, and what, and I, I'm curious what you do in that situation. Do you just slog ahead or do you pull up another story or well, novel and work you know, on something some, else? Sometimes it's just slow and I just need to bump it by saying, I'm just going to write one sentence and I'll write that one sentence and all of a sudden it's flowing. And I have little tricks like that I do, you know, or, um, but but sometimes I, I'll I'll just switch to another story that I have. I usually have little things that I'm that I tinker with and I'll go in and mess with that for a while and I might work on it that day and then the next day I'll come back and things are fine. Or sometimes I'll say, Well, you know what, I'm just gonna take the day off because I've been working for <clears throat> steadily for weeks. Things are fine. I think I'll just you know, take the day off and just read all day or go uh go to martial arts practice, you know, when it's not my night, so to speak, when I'm not training people. And, uh, oh, I will go to a movie today. Oh, I may take this to watch the box set I've got for TV, you know. I mean, I can, I can do any of those, those things or just uh, say, okay, today I'm just going to veg, you know. My mind is just dead. But that's a, that's a rare thing for me. I'm doing that right now because I was traveling, and then I went on the set of the movie Cold in July that they're filming. And so while I was on that set, we had to get up and go early and do, you know, all till late at night. So I, did, I didn't write for two weeks. I came back, and the only thing I've written since I've been home for three days is an article, a short article that I wrote. And uh, then I'm going to the World Science Fiction Convention tomorrow. I'll take my laptop with me. But if I don't work, that's fine. But when I get back on m Monday night, Tuesday morning, I'm back to work. 
And, uh, you know, I'll push a little bit if I have a hard time. I'll try my tricks if I have a hard time. If not, I'll just say, you know what? You're productive. You do, you do work. I can say that because I, I, I can feel confident I can do it. Take sure. a day off. And then sure. when I come back, I'm, I'm ready to go. So, so you just mentioned it. So tell us about Cold in July and the movie they're working on. Oh, well, you know, Cold in July is a novel that I wrote in 1989. And I think, well, maybe 88, I think it came out in 89. And it's a period piece that they're doing. It wasn't a period piece when I wrote it. It was the present. But now it's, it's historical in a way. So they, it takes place in 1989. It's one of my earlier crime novels. I think it was one of my first true straightforward crime novels. And it's always had an impact on readers. And, and I remember it, uh, the story. And I wrote it in two months. Right by, I wrote the drive-in in two months, and I wrote this one right behind it. I took you know, the very next day, I spoke the end of one, and the very next day, I started the uh, Cold in July after I finished the drive-in. And I wrote those two back-to-back because I had contracts for them. And it was a dream. Cold in July was a dream. I, I, we, we were trying to buy a house at that time, and we went and looked at one that had a bullet hole in the ceiling. And when I went home that night, I thought, I wonder how that bullet hole got there. <laughs> and so it led to me dreaming the entire plot in one night of Cold in July. And then we had an editor coming to visit for another book, that uh, a nonfiction book that they never actually published that was on the Wild West. Uh, and uh, he was coming to, for us to edit it. And he came to visit. And my wife said, tell me about that dream you had. And I said, well, I, I had this dream. So this, this in a sense, is, is one of those rare cases where the whole thing was plotted, but not consciously. I just dreamed the whole thing. And I told it to him. And he said, sold. And so I, I wrote that book right behind the one I was working on, the drive-in, and, uh, you know, that that's what happened. And then the book's been auctioned, was auctioned many, many times, and then this group had it for about six years, and they finally got it going. They got Michael C. Hall starring in it and Sam Shepard, and uh, there's some people that that I can't mention right now because they're kind of saving that back, but sure, a sure. couple of really, really nice actors are in it, and... Uh, um, I think it's going to be very successful from all the stuff I've seen on set, from the uh, directing, from the acting, from the stunts, and from uh, uh, the drama. I, I, I'm really pleased. That, I even have a little bit part in it if I don't get cut out. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Hopefully you won't end up on the cutting room floor. Yeah, I hope not. It probably wouldn't hurt. Well, it won't hurt anything if I am, trust me. <laughs> I hear you. So so um, any any tentative date or, or date range of when that might be in theater well i know i know they're gonna have it finished uh this week oh. and uh it, it will then go to post-production I, I i would and i think they're on a really tight and fast post-production schedule my guess it'll probably start going to film festivals like sundance and stuff in january which i'm sure it's going to make it's that good uh and then it will be a matter of what kind of distribution they get and how quick they get it sure sure well, uh, i'm assuming 2014 but it could yeah. be as late as 2015 sure well, well, I know this is a hypothetical question, but but is there any piece of knowledge about the writing or publishing business that you that you have now that you wish you had known earlier in your career? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, everything that that I, I you know I, I figured it out as I went and I absorbed it as I went, so I don't know if I, I know how to think of it in in that way. Sure. I, I think the only the only thing that I would say is that, you know, they're doing it and having faith in yourself and, and, and not waiting for to see something's rejected. I, I think that's it just, you know, not set this, like, yeah, set this out. I'm not going to let it what comes back, but to start something new as soon as you can reasonably do it, you know, and keep that up. Sure. That's the approach. Sure. Well, as you're as you're aware, ebooks have changed the ability to self publish in, in a huge way. And in, in, in years past, before ebooks came about, if you wanted to self publish, you had to shell out a lot of money for a very manual yeah. process, and then you ended up with boxes of books sitting in your garage. If if you were starting your writing career now, would would you be tempted? Do you think to self publish, or would you pursue a traditional? You know, publishing I, I'm book? not opposed to self publishing, and, and uh, you know, I, and I actually think writers that are always successful can do that better. But I, I find that, that the problem I have, it isn't so much self publishing but the fact that people don't try to publish it in such a way that they can get more attention. And they just say, well, fuck it, I'm not going to deal with all of these people. I just don't want to have to deal with editors. And so they put it out there and they sell 500 copies a year. Now, if that's what they're happy doing, 
that's fine, and that may be where I end up. You know, nobody knows what their future is going to be. But the thing is, I think you should start by having it vetted by somebody else because there's something powerful about being able to get through that barrier. And it doesn't mean every editor is a wizard. Some of them are dumbasses, and some of them are brilliant, just like writers. But I really believe you should you should go that route. At this point, I still think that's the most viable route. You know, I'm not suggesting like all my old books. I keep I keep the rights. I have the e rights, and even the publishers that have wanted them, they also wanted the e rights. I wouldn't do it. So I have separated that, and I'm doing e books with uh, other companies. I'm going to be doing some just the paperback books with some smaller companies. I've always been someone that was willing to experiment, so I would never say that I wouldn't self-publish. In fact, I have a couple of projects that I may do just that. Sure. But I wouldn't suggest that be the first place you go. Right. I think there's something powerful about being vetted, and I think it makes you work harder. Because if you know you can publish it yourself, you just go, well, you know, that's good enough. That's good enough. Sure. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you offer a lot of writing advice via Facebook, and I would definitely encourage any listeners who are aspiring writers to to follow you on Facebook for your thoughts and, and insight. You. Hey, have you considered writing a nonfiction book about writing? I have. Uh, I've thought about gathering like the, the tips I've done and just having a book of tips, and then I've thought about doing something more autobiographical. I mean, I really don't know, but it's in my mind to do that at some point. I just really don't know what I'm going to do, but I think it's very likely. Sure. And and what advice would you offer aspiring writers who who would like to to eventually have a career selling their own novels and short stories? I, it's very simple: read and put your ass in a chair and write. That's that's, that's it. Okay, and have a regular schedule. Well, I, I know that you're a big reader. What what have you read yeah. in the past year or two that that really impressed you and that you would recommend, either fiction or nonfiction? Well, you know what I've been doing a lot of is reading a lot of old literature. I've read a lot of uh, Hemingway and a lot of F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, a lot of Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I've also been reading a lot of historical stuff, like a terrible story by Jim Donovan, which is uh, about the Custer fight, and uh, he wrote a book about the Alamo that I read. But, uh, and I've been reading a lot of old science fiction by Philip Jose Farmer. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm really in kind of a reread mood right now. Um, I was trying to think of the last book that just knocked me dead, and it would, it would only be the classics. You know, that's for this year. That doesn't mean it's going to I mean, for last year and up until now. Sure. That doesn't mean it's not going to change. But I've also been reading a lot of um, books about the Old West because I'm – I've been interested in it all my life, and my next novel is a big giant western after the thicket. So that's that's the the big giant western that you've mentioned in previous yep. interviews. You're finally going to sit yep. down and write it. It's called, yeah, it was originally called The True Life Adventures of Deadwood Dick, but it's now called Paradise Sky. Great, great. Well, we look forward to that. So, so are you? Are what are you working on now? I mean, I know you you uh, said well, earlier I'm working on been... Paradise Sky. That's what I'm writing right now, and I have a couple of novellas that I have to pause and do that I've agreed to do, and then probably after that, I think I'm going to be pulling in my horns on some of the shorter work. I'm working on a screenplay with my son that I hope to get the money to direct myself, but we'll see if that happens. That's great. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Joe Lansdale. His new novel, The Thicket, is in bookstores now. So grab a copy or download a copy to your ebook reader. Joe, thanks for doing this interview. I loved it. Thank you. Free shipping in continental U.S. only. See website for subscription offer details. Calling all partners. Losing weight is better together with Nutrisystem's new partner plan. It's so much easier when you do it together. You'll both get new premium meals with up to 30 grams of protein. They're big and filling and taste delicious. New skillet selections that go from pan to plate in minutes. And new restaurant faves that taste like your favorite restaurant meals portioned at half the calories. Powered by the science of ProSync to help keep your blood sugar steady and you losing weight. Motivate each other, keep each other accountable, and reach your goals with Nutrisystem's partner plan. Just go to Nutrisystem.com slash diet right now and get 50% off. You heard me right. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash diet right now and get 50% off everything. Don't wait. This special offer will not last long. Just go to Nutrisystem.com slash diet right now and get 50% off. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash slash diet.